another friends sponsored programs and why can't we all get along with Bob Wilder? Hi, thank you. Nice group here today. You should have some hanging off the uh, balcony. Uh, the story I'm going to tell you tonight, it, it really hasn't been told, and it needs to be told. It reaches back into our history, and uh, it's hard to imagine that just a quarter of a mile from here, people were, were shooting it out over religion. Uh, churches were destroyed. Many things happened here in our community and surrounding communities. I'll tell you about a terrific battle between Brookfield and uh, West Brookfield. <coughs> North Brookfield got into the thing and, and supported Brookfield, and they didn't like those people in West Brookfield either. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to start. In order for you to understand the story, I have to give you the hard part. I'm going to take you back to school and show you a chart and explain to you what the town looked like and then why it broke up. And then that gives you the genesis for why all these other activities would happen. So with that in mind, I made an overlay here. And this overlay, you see the white line? Did everyone see that white line? Mm -hmm. Okay, in 1660, a grant was uh, given to uh, Lieutenant Cooper from Springfield from the local Indians, and it was six miles square. It, it wasn't six square miles. If you would take all the sides and add them together, you had 36 square miles. And for the reference purposes, this is the center of East Brookfield. This is the center village of North Brookfield. This is where we are now in Brookfield. The center village of West Brookfield and the center village of Warren. I neglected New Brainfield and where because the center villages are too far off the map in order to put them in there. <clears throat> Meeting house is here. Now, as time went on, uh, in 1701, we had 100 families here. The town had been destroyed in 1675. In 11 years, we didn't have any settlers here. Most of was here, but the settlers were not. When they came back, uh, out uh, along Elmhill Farm Road, six families settled. And a few months later, out near Fort Gilbert, West Brookfield, another six families settled. All the land in between, they couldn't settle because it was, this, is, this was uh, a government of laws, and people owned that property until such time as they divested of their property, swapped it with the, with the government for other properties, or sold it outright. Other people couldn't settle upon it. So that left this huge void in here. Well, by 1701, most of that problem was resolved. They applied for another grant. They wanted to extend the town to 100 families, and 36 square miles was not enough for them. And they complained to the general court. The general court said, OK, we'll extend your grant eight miles to the side. The surveyor made a mistake on this side here and added an extra half mile to it. So I did put a bit of a cant to it, but not near as much as it should have had. So now we're dealing with 65 and a half square miles of the town. And that wasn't enough. Back in the original grant, John Pynchon from uh, Springfield, who was the Sears and Roebuck. He gave you items, and you worked it out with trade. You paid him in turn with any way you could, goods and trade. He was given 500 acres up on Coy Hill in Warren. In 1717, there was a hue and a cry. We can't develop this. We need some kind of compensation. So they reached into West Medford, which is now Sturbridge, Mass. And right down here at the bottom, it's the bottom of present uh, Brookfield, they gave us almost a square mile of land and attached it there. That's Rice Corner Road and Gay Road area. You'll be glad no longer you're still in Brookfield. <laughs> At any rate, now I'll go on and you'll see, you see the uh, geographic uh, meeting house? Geographically, from this corner to the other corner, is 13 miles. Now, at a time when we had very few good roads that could be traveled with two-wheel carts, let alone four. And most people didn't have horses, they had oxen. And it was mandatory that the families attend the meeting when it, when, it, when it was held. People coming from the far corners had to travel six and a half miles each way to get the meeting house. And, and some distances in between, you know. So the end result was that was a real burden. 
you had oxen, it would take you a full day just to go there and come back, let alone send four or five hours in meeting. And for town meeting, it was much the same thing. When it was over, you had to travel home in the dark. And that was a long way, even by horse. So it was a, it was a problem. Warren was the first to complain. Warren said, we want to be our own town. In 1740, they applied to the general court to be separated. General court returned their application saying, it's so poorly written, we don't understand what you want. Mm -hmm. So the next year, uh, they very skillfully concocted uh, and, and petitioned the uh, general court, and the general court said, yes, you may be your own town. So that separated Warren, and it's 22 families. Now I say families. If a woman had lost her husband and she was there with 10 kids, they didn't count. It was the voters that were counted. The women count, truly, but <laughs> the voters are what counted. So this is what everything is based on, the people who can vote. There were 22 voters in Warren, and they left town. So now we have our first separation. 1750, the people from Ware, the Olmsted family and two other families, would rather go to Ware Center because it was only a six mile round trip than to have to make that horrendous trip of almost 13 miles to meeting into the meeting house. They asked to be separated. And the two sections of Ware and New Braintree, the bottom third of New Braintree was in the original town, in the original eight mile square. And they had seven families that lived in there, seven voting families. And they also had this horrendous trip. And they asked to be uh, separated. And the general court permitted it. Now, because of this half mile here, and nobody figured it out till 1798 when Hale did a survey, it took New Braintree till 1820 to get their boundaries straightened out. Every time somebody else surveyed it, they had a different reference point and it came out there. So it took them a great long time to straighten this mess out. But for all intent and purposes, 1750, they're gone. And you can see the map is beginning to open up. Now the next one, in 1812, North Brookfield. North Brookfield is a, is a quarter of the town, a quarter of the original town, and they've got 75 voters in that town. So they have a lot of power, a lot of influence. And they asked the town uh, to separate, and they said no. They applied to the general court, they approved it, and <coughs> we lost North Brookfield. Now they, a lot of white begin to show up there, isn't it? Now we've got one parish. First parish, East Brookfield, present East Brookfield, Brookfield, and West Brookfield. So in 1848, West Brookfield applies and asks to be incorporated, and it was approved. And West Brookfield left us. And you can see what Brookfield is, what's left in Brookfield. It went on, interesting note, in 1798, the people uh, along this section of North Pond and the east shore of North Pond petitioned, petitioned to become their own town. But they had a petition through the, through the town itself, and the, and the town itself said no. So consequently, we never had a podunk Massachusetts. If it had been approved, we truly would have. In, 18, in 1920, East Brookfield petitioned to separate. They had been having trouble with the folks over here for a long time. Hard to understand why, but they were. And so, the general court said, well, we'll leave it up to the two towns to be to decide where the boundaries are going to be. So Brookfield said, well, we'll fix them. So they went down Dunbrook, right through the middle of North Pond, down through the middle of the channel, and down through South Pond. We kept two bridges. We gave them seven. That was the most expensive things to maintain and repair, and they were beside themselves. So Brookfield was very pleasant and said, all right, we'll move everything over, and we'll give you this corner. It was a small pie-shaped piece far too small to be considered a town. They decided they would accept the initial one. I don't think they've liked this ever since. But the fact remains, we now lost East Brookfield. And here's what remains. Now isn't that interesting? All because we were too big for our own boots. Now, I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you where the intrigue truly started. The lawn is gone, the break is gone, and the weigher is gone. And here's what's left. I want to get my dates right, so I'm going to be, keep coming back to this. So. 
Bear with me. North Brookfield. North Brookfield petitioned the town, the town, and asked to be a separate parish. The town said no. They went and petitioned the general court, and the general court says, yes, you may. They petitioned initially in 1748. It took two years, but the general court allowed it. So they became the second parish. The first parish, and this is going to cause a lot of problems, the first parish was now West Brookfield, Brookfield, and East Brookfield. North Brookfield now is a separate parish. It's allowed to have a church. And they started building a church. And it took them 10 years. Matter of fact, the church is down on Route 148, uh, not quite a mile from town. There's a marker there on the left-hand side as you're going into town. And you can see where the old uh, meeting house stood. They started to build it. 10 years later, it wasn't done. They were pretty slow to work, but the people were pretty well spread out, too. You can understand that. They had to travel great distances to do that work. Matter of fact, by the time it would, it would stand back and say it's finished, they had to tear the roof off and put another one on because it had rotted away. So this gives you an idea how fast they moved. Several years later, uh, 1854, they moved uptown. They had an alder swamp up in the center of town. They, they leveled that, and they built their church there. And as the Civil War came on, they had two groups, abolitionists and those people who supported slavery, and they couldn't get along. They split. And a Union church was built in North Brookfield. So now they have two basically congregational churches with different thrusts completely. And you know, during the Revolutionary War, a third of the people in this country supported breaking with, with King George. And the other two thirds never once really supported it. But here in Massachusetts, it's a different story. If you didn't support King George, you were run out of the state. By law, you were run out of the state. Uh, General Ruff, Ruggles from, uh, uh, where did he live? Hardwick. Yeah, so he was run out of town. And, and they, they gathered up most of his uh, uh, properties. Uh, we had, in Brookfield, we had one house that right into the century. It was called the Tory House. It's up on Route 148. It, it would be the site. It would be the site. If you come out Maple Street on 148 and you were to turn to the, to the north and, and head on towards Elm Hill Road, it would be the third house on the left uh, is, was the Tory House. And it was painted red. And we don't know why, but it probably had something to do with them being Tories. North Brookfield had this wonderful minister. He had been here for 30 odd years. His name was Forbush. But he couldn't have been that good because he took a perfectly good name in short and he called himself Forbes. And there was a lot of people looking down their nose about that. That wasn't the right thing to do. But he was also a very mild-mannered uh, preacher. He didn't rant and rave. And when it came time to support the revolution, he still was very quiet and calm. And they thought he was too uh, laid back in his, in his attitudes. And they began to suggest he might be a Tory. And it got so bad that boys used to chase his chaise when he went around his church business in town and throw stones at it and send their dogs after him. And he persevered until one morning he came out and on his step was a jar of tar and a bag of feathers. And he left town. That was subtle enough hint. And he went on to the east and he, and he, and he was a, uh, had several churches after that. And contrary to what people in North Brookfield thought, he, he was indeed very supportive of the revolution only in his quiet way. Now, comes the big battle. I want to tell you, I want to read you one thing out of Temple's book, though, on what we did to North Brookfield for daring to break away when we said no. December 2nd, 1776, a resolve was passed calling for the towns to furnish several quotas of men for the army, and they were to be enlisted for three years. Not Minutemen, not people who would go on a campaign, come back, and they went back to farming. These were men who had a contract, and they would go anywhere in the country they were sent as permanent members of the army for that three years. Brookfield quota was 33. These poor people got eight of them. We fixed them. But they were in a position where, financially, they might not be able to handle that. So in the town meeting, they voted that the soldiers who may engage in three years service shall have the liberty to take this security of individuals whom they shall choose, and that the precinct will identify, identify, 
indemnify such persons giving their security on behalf of the precinct. What you were saying was the soldiers would pick the richest man in town. We'd all pick Mr. Jansen over there, Jenkins over there, say, I pick him. And if the town didn't come up with the money for your, your wherewithal, your weapons, your food, and what have you, he had to answer for it. And then he said the town would attempt to pay him in turn. So you see how what a, a really nasty trick because all the rest of the town was supporting the others. It wasn't a very fair uh, ratio. Now, meeting house sits here. And it was decided in 1754. In 1754, this was the number of voters in the various towns. West Brookfield, as it stands today, had 43. Uh, Brookfield had 24, and the other part of Brookfield had 47, a total of 71 in this town here. Well, they wanted to build a new meeting house. West Brookfield wanted it in West Brookfield. Brookfield wanted it right up here on, on, in Brookfield. Now, the West people from Brookfield did not want to go down Bannister Hill, up Foster Hill, down the other side, and onto the plain in West Brookfield. Same with the people in West Brookfield. They didn't want to climb Foster Hill, go down the other side, and up Bannister Hill. Well, the battle went on for a while, discussions, meetings. One day, the people from West Brookfield went to Foster Hill, and they were amazed. Most of the frame of the church was gone. The meeting house was gone. Well, it didn't take them long to figure out where it was, because they were busy assembling it on a common right out here in Brookfield. <laughs> <laughs> so the, general, the, the people from West Brookfield sent a rider to the general court. <laughs> You've got to help us. We need a referee. So the referee came down. And majority rules. 43 people wanted half the material. They said well, we should have half of the material in the church. Well, there's 71 here. There's no question. And then these people in North Brookfield didn't like these folks. They jumped in and threw their weight behind this parish. So we got to keep the church or the meeting house praying. And West Brookfield was given, present West Brookfield was given permission to build their own church. Well, this caused a terrible ruckus because this is the second parish, and East Brookfield, Brookfield, and West Brookfield were the first parish. Well, when the order came out from the general court allowing Brookfield to keep the church and them to build one, they said the third parish may keep the church frame, and the first parish may build their own church. What a hue and cry! Who in the first parish? And they argued about that. The general court said, the die is cast, it's over. This is what's going to happen. Well, these people fixed them. They went and collected all of the town records. They all sit in the town clerk's office in Brookfield today from 1717 on. We didn't share them with West Brookfield, but they're welcome to come and look at them anytime they choose. <laughs> well, this, this uh, meeting house was moved down, not on the mall section, but on the common section right across the street from where the Unitarian Church is. That's the stone church where people are not familiar with town. And it was, that's where the meeting house sat. And I'm going to read uh, this wonderful little book written by a Brookfield boy, Charles Howell. He, put, he, he was born in 1822 and he wrote down everything he knew about the town. And it's a wonderful little book. I don't know if the library has it, but I have it. And if you need to see it, I'll share it with you. He describes it. He says, Here was a street running down from the main street, and along this street was the mall. This was some 60 or 80 feet wide, which led up to the boarding house, the meeting house. Oh, that's a wrong debate. The meeting house. He said it was the Mall, the meeting house was bordered on either side by rows of elm trees, huge elm trees, which also ran along the main road. The old meeting house was very large, had an entrance to the base of its tail, right here, the tall steeple. It had a door in the south southern part, and it also had a door in the eastern part. The reason the door in the eastern part was there was, he describes there were large horse sheds, three or four hundred feet long. When the, when the, when the people put their horses or animals in there that it from some distance. So then they just had to cross a short section of the muddy lawn to uh, put themselves into the church. Inside were men's pews and ladies' pews, all enclosed. They were boxed in so that the boys 
were put in a place where they were out of sight. Uh, there was, of course, the high pulpit and broad galleries on three sides. In short, anyone of, anyone of you who have seen the interior of the Old South Church in Boston will know exactly what the meeting house looked like. Now, let me share this with you. Ten years ago, I was real ill in the hospital for about 30 days. One, one day, a couple of weeks into my stay, I woke up and I found this book on my bed. Great New England Churches. And a little note says, Dear Bob, you seem to be having such a pleasant dream, we felt we should not wake you up. We look forward to seeing you back in the center of the universe, a.k.a. Brookfield, signed Rudy and Sarah Keller. The, thing, the reason I brought this and wanted to share it with you today is there's a beautiful picture of the Old South Church. I'm going to leave this open here so anybody that's curious what it, what it looked like. Uh, it shows the galleries. You only can say two of the three galleries, the high pulpit, the boxed in uh, pews. So I'll leave that out so if anybody that's interested can come and share that with me. Now, the first parish in West Brookfield built their church. They built it in 1855. <clears throat> 1870, uh, 1798 in West Brookville on Ragged Hill, another religious sect was developing. This was called the Methodists. They met in barns, they met in attics, they met wherever, people's houses. Well, they came to Brookville. They weren't glad to have them here. Cooley's Tavern. Cooley's Tavern is up on 148, again, just before you come to this, the uh, uh, junction of uh, Elm Hill Farm and 148 going to North Brookfield. You'll see David Simmons, a little green cottage. David Simmons who lives here presently. They were having a meeting there. Here's another wonderful book. Ragged Hill Methodist. It's not all about Methodists. It covers a religion in all the towns. Someone very, very carefully uh, documented it. Uh, it's written in 1913. And what they say, when the Methodists began to talk about building a second Methodist church in town, they were met with fierce opposition and even threats of violence. At a class meeting held at Mr. Ephraim Cooley's home, a rifle ball was fired through an open window. The ball barely missed Mr. Cooley, the leader, and struck the leg of the table in front of him and took out a big splinter, then deflecting past close over the head of the woman ill in bed. Three men who had previously threatened them were seen running for the woods. The table with a bullet mark in it was presented to the church by Miss Martha Cooley Johnson, one of the daughters who was present when the shot was fired. And now it stands in the vestry of the Brookfield Church, a memento from earlier days. They weren't very well received. In 1829, they built a church here, down on Quaybog Street, heading towards North Pond. There's a, a little housing development, there's like a, a big, formed a big letter U. The furthest uh, towards the pond was the area where the church sat. In 1847, they bought land, Uptown. Congregational church sits here. Right next to it, they bought that lot of land and they built the church there. <clears throat> this book describes, Ragged Hill book describes that church as identical to the one in West Brookfield, same blueprint, so you get an idea. It was a really gorgeous building. Now, they moved on to the town hall site. Some other people came to town. 1824, um, 1824 to 1827, the Unitarians came here, and they caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> Anybody Unitarian here? <laughs> You're not going to like me when I get that. <laughs> <laughs> the Unitarians came to town. Now, they were so disruptive, I'm not even going to begin to tell you. But I'm going back to this nice little book, and I'm going to read this. And they made a mistake in here. They named Brookfield as the first parish. And it should have been the third. But we'll forgive them because they did pretty well in everything else they did here. It says, these were troublous times for all those who were religiously inclined in Brookfield. In January 1827, the third parish, by a vote, 41 yeas to 25 nays, 
requested the resignation of the Reverend Stone, their pastor. <coughs> he was a very strict congregationalist. <coughs> this was a culmination of trouble for this parish, which led to the call of Reverend George Noyes, a pronounced Unitarian, who was pastor, which left no alternative to the loyal disciples of the Lord Jesus, but an absolute surrender of their faith or a withdrawal from the parish. And so, 37 out of a total of 49 members of the church withdrew, leaving the parish in the possession of the property. These members of the church held their Calvinistic faiths, began immediately to hold service in various places. They rented an attic and so forth until they had their building done. They built the building in 1828. And that building, if you see the Brookfield Inn, and look directly across the street from Brookfield Inn, there's a vacant lot. There's where they built their congregational church. Now, Boyce May, who was a uh, citizen of this town for years and years and years, and everybody from Brookfield who's been here any time at all will remember him. He remembers in the late teens of the early 20s going to that church site and tearing the steeple down. After the congregationalists built their new church on the corner out here, then it was rented out. It was an apartment building until finally it was destroyed. Now, 1849, this, this church moves around a lot. Remember, it was on Foster Hill. Now it's sitting here. The Unitarians moved across the street to the lot where the present stone church is. People wanted to rent that. They didn't want to be in the business of renting it. So what they did was they turned it over to an association. Mr. Hayden from town who was... Uh, very important and, and played a big part in, in putting the new stone, the big stone gate down on the cemetery. He did a lot of many other things to the library as well. He was in charge and he was renting it. He was renting it for town meetings. Uh, he was renting it for dances and oh heavens, the Catholics. Imagine that. I'll tell you more about them in a little while. In 1857, a new congregational church was built down here in the corner. That beautiful church is standing there. Well, the skyline changed because in 1862, the steeple fell right through the roof and right through the ceiling. Now, when that happened, the reverend, good reverend in the Methodist church next door had something to say about this. And here's what he said. Regarding pride and vanity, the other society, the Congregationalists, in their pride, had raised their steeple too high, and the Lord had rebuked them. <laughs> Oh, they don't get the last laugh, though. <laughs> now, this, this is, the Lord was listening. 1864, let me read the, what happened. I have to read this so you get the full flavor. I could never, never deliver it like this. It says, the official board of the Methodist Church Remember the little church looked like the West Brookfield Methodist Church? Mm -hmm. Saw the need of better church accommodations, and after due deliberation, they decided to raise the building. They were going to jack it up and put a vestry under it, and also to widen and lengthen it so as to increase its seating capacity. The church had just been raised to the desired height. On September 25th, 1864, when a tornado struck, it was a big wind and completely demolished the church. The people stood amazed and were discouraged in the presence of the wreck. When the news of the disaster reached the pastor, Reverend Smith, he kindly remarked, the Lord was in the whirlwind. And he started planning to build his church down on River Street, in the last lot on the left, heading towards the main street. And this was going to be a beautiful and, and uh, commodious church. But then they had another problem there. Incidentally, while they were building their church and had no place to go, guess who took them in? The Congregationalists. They talk about forgiveness. I'd let them stand out in the rain, but they, they let them in. At any rate, uh, they used the Congregational Vestry until a new church was built. In 1864, the Methodists did build a new church. Then he ran into a bit of a problem. The workers one morning, uh, part of the committee went down to inspect the work, and they were all sitting down. They refused to work. 
they weren't satisfied with the pay. We got our first strike in Greater Brookfield. And they ended up settling for $3.50 a day. And then they went back to work and finished the church. <laughs> now, in 1867, the old church site, the Methodist church was destroyed, right behind the congregational church, was sold to the town hall, or was sold to the town, which proceeded to build a wooden town hall there. And it was quite large, and it had six stores in the first uh, floor until such time as it was destroyed by uh, fire beginning of this uh, 20th century. Now we get come to this part. The Catholics. Remember this old meeting house? It was swiped from West Brookfield, moved to the convent, jumped the road for the Unitarians, the Catholics came. Reverend Morin bought from the universities the uh, the church, and they moved it across the common and put it right where it sits today. That's St. Mary's Church. Now I have to tell you something. When, when the Universalists took over the uh, Congregational Church, they, they gained all the property. It ended up at a soup in Worcester, and the Congregationalists lost, and the Unitarians won. Again, they were the majority. There was a beautiful communion set made by Paul Revere, engraved Town of Brookfield Congregational Church, donated by Mary Dodge Barrett, 1756. The Unitarians took that with them and refused to loan it to the uh, Congregationalists when they asked on a loan, just to loan. And they refused to loan it to them. In 1933, their furnace burned out. They decided to put the communion set up for bid. And it was bought and it disappeared. And no one seemed to know where it went. When I was working at Old Surbridge Village, uh, there was a fellow there by the name of Jim Dell. Not the Dell that makes computers, but this guy was a whiz with computers. And I was talking to him about my problem. He said, I'll try to help you. And about a week later, he came back and I said, I think I found it. I'll be gone for a few days. When I come back, I'll tell you what I find. And he did. He went away and he came back. He says, yeah. He says, I found it. And I was all excited. Where did you find it? He says, it's one of the primary exhibits in the Winter Theater Museum in Delaware. He says, you walk into the room, and the first thing you see up there, he says, is this beautiful communion set made by Paul Revere, a congregational church, town of Brookfield, and donated by Mary Dodge uh, Barrett. He said, I learned something else, too. He said, I got the information on the bidding process, and he said, in there I found that the Unitarians had put it up for bid, provided no person from Brookfield, no member of the Congregational Church nor his board were allowed to bid on it. Now, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Next time you go by the Unitarian Church, throw eggs. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, into this town came the Catholics. And we didn't make it easy for them. They worked in the service industry. They worked in the shoes. We had three shoe factories in this town. And we also had a heel factory going down Lower River Street. And, uh, so anyway, uh, they came here in great numbers. And in order to go to church, to, to begin with, they had to walk down the hill to the depot. They knew when the, when the priest was coming by, and they would go down, he would do a very short mass, because he had to be back on the train when it left. So we did his very fast, fast math and jumped down the train. Well, they began to improve things as, as time went on, and more and more Catholics came here. And then they began to have their services in different attics and uh, Mr. Kelly's house, wherever Mr. Kelly lived, he became the church for a great long time. Then Friar Murphy came in 1891, and he uh, modified the existing church over here. He added several feet to the, would be the south end, made the altar. Uh, he also had the inside, the entire inside of it uh, covered with uh, hand plain boxwood or American linden and added 18 stained glass windows, which then had the Gothic top, and it still remains in that fashion today. And the town records it. We got away from West Brookfield. It's in the town clerk's office today. Uh, you can go in there and start from 1717 on, and you have to work it. It's hard to see, and a lot of pages are on double. But you can find who owned these pews, because they bought the pews, and then their, their deeds passed them on to, 
different different other people, other progenies, whichever. And uh, so it's wonderful to see that. And he did that primarily to maintain the church. The money they got from uh, selling the pews was used for maintaining the church. Now back to the Unitarians. In 1868, these people built a church, a beautiful wood church right where the stone church used to sit. Well, it sits now, but where the old meeting house used to sit. Sorry, misspoke. But then they couldn't compete with the uh, congregational church that had its 110 foot steeple, nor could they compete with the Methodists who had a 100 foot steeple, so they didn't hold them both. They built a church with two steeples, and if you added it up, they beat them both. <laughs> boy, oh boy, they show us. Well, unfortunately for them, in 1911, that church burned. And Nancy's mother remembers this very well. And in 1912, the new stone church was built. So now, I want to take you back into early New England. Because we're talking about the Catholics right now. And I want to give you an idea how ill they were treated in early New England, particularly in the 18th, 17th, 18th centuries. The laws in the state of the government of Massachusetts stated, if a priest is shipwrecked off the shore of Massachusetts, he's to be brought ashore, he's to be fed, he's to be clothed, intended to until the first ship leaving for the continent, and he's to be put on it and sent away. <laughs> However, if he used any of the accoutrements of his religion, if he showed any outward visual, visual sign with the bells and the twinkles and, and, and the praying and all the other things that he did, he, he would have notified the justice of the peace, and he was to summarily execute this man. How do you like that? <clears throat> I want to read how bad <laughs> the congregations were of the Methodists. The laws of Massachusetts in 17, uh, 1834 said that every person who was taxed for property, part of that tax would go to support the ministers of the Orthodox Church, the, the uh, Congregational Church. Let me tell you how bad it got. This is poor fellow. He was a, he was a preacher, Joshua Crowell. He mentions a time when his health was so precarious that he was obliged to rest for a year. He hired a small place in Ware and bought a cow to help him eke out a living. But as he had no money to meet the church rate for the support of the Orthodox minister, the tithing man came and took his only cow and sold her at public auction to satisfy the parish minister's claim to his salary. <laughs> you know, it goes on and on. Now, New Braintree. They were more Calvinistic than North Brookville or, or West Brookville. Or Brookfield. They were strictly puritanic, very strict, very conservative. Well, two of the members made a mistake of wanting to be published to the North Brookfield Church. It was closer to them, and they wanted to go to the North Brookfield Church. Well, <laughs> from the pulpit, the, the minister from the Brantry commented, I think two people here think it's easier to get to heaven from North Brookfield than it is from New Braintree. <laughs> <laughs> now, the first sermon that was ever given in Brookfield was in West Brookfield. It was at the meeting house up on Foster Hill. It was given at the ordination of Brookfield's first ordained preacher, Reverend Thomas Cheney, by Solomon Stoddard of New Hampshire. And he titled it, most appropriate for the Brookfield citizens, The Duty of the Gospel Preachers to Preserve a People from Corruption. Apparently, he didn't do a very good job. We're still fighting. Now, I want to talk to the Brookfield people. Here's the problem. There's an inn that sits right here. They call it the 1773 house. And uh, Mr. Fletcher, who uh, was a teacher in Brookfield School for many years, wrote a book about that house. That was Colonel Crosby's house. And he says where Nancy Salem uh, sat in that house one day, looked diagonally across the street, saw that inn, and said, we have to put a date on that. Let's call it the 1773 house. Well. They advertised themselves as that. Of course, it was all blown frame when they had to take it apart and all. So that, that sort of threw that theory out the window. But I found a newspaper written 20 years after the fact that 1666, someone burned it down. It actually sat at the end of the common where the big brown house is, and there's a rather stately house that was Fales House just before you get to Kimblewood. 
That's where it's at, and the pound pound was right behind it. Well, they started to build it back up, Doug, I didn't know somebody else burned it down. So in, in uh, 1868, they built it, they went to a new lot, figured they had better luck there, and apparently they did, and they built it at the present site. So that's where it is now. Now, another amazing thing is right down the street here, two houses down the street, uh, is a large brick house with an L on it. A large brick house. This, this young man here talks about sitting at the door of that and watching a man commit suicide across the street with a gunshot. Well, he sits the brick house across the street. You go down to the, uh, to the old post road, and you'll, you'll, first thing you'll find is Kimblewood, and you move on, and there's a park, ballpark. Well, at the, at the other side of the driveway, on the, would be the uh, east side of the driveway, is where that brick house sat. In 1830, it's not here in the common. The only thing there is a school, and that moved across the street and was parked right beside the Congregational Church after that. The only other house on this side of the common was uh, Mr. Bannister's house, which stands right out here now. Uh, and the, the newspaper describes from there to the river was nothing but rocks and brush. So there wasn't very much settlement there. Where's Carolyn? That leaves you in the brush yet. <laughs> but at any rate, that house was moved. It was at that big brick house was moved, and you say, well, how in the world did they do that? Well, let me tell you my first-hand experience with that. In Warren, right behind the depot, is this huge grain shed made of brick, very, very beautifully made, uh, probably 40 feet wide and 80 feet long. And when the town, when the state said that the, there'd be no more great crossings of the roads, the two roads across the railroad track there in the center of Warren were diverted, and they went down and they dug a pit and they went under the underpass. Well, this was right in the way of the Southbridge Road. So they moved that. They moved that, they used a steam engine, and they used oxen, and they did it on the rollers by putting it up on beams. And somebody questioned, we had I. Walter Moore, who was the uh, tax collector in that town, absolutely forever. He had been there, when I was there, he was 90 years old. He, he had been there forever. And somebody challenged him, they says, uh, uh, how in the world could they move that? He says, they did it, I saw it, and that's that. And he walked away. That was the end. <laughs> that old monkey had his way. Now, there's one more thing I'm going to talk to you about. Right here, right across the street from, from uh, the, the library here, it's a white house and a, and a red barn attached to it. And you'll notice the top floor, and that doesn't look right. And it isn't. In, in 1898, the top floor burned. And that was a beautiful, beautiful federal house with two chimneys and a hip roof and a whole nine yards. But they decided they would put up a blue framed house. Blue frames, two by fours, and sheathing, and that sort of thing. And that's what they did with a modern style roof on it. And that's on the uh, that's in the uh, uh, fire department records. However, if you go past the house and you look back, and you're looking at the north side of the house, you'll see the beautiful keystone lintels over the top of the, the window, still there from the, on the bottom floor, and that would date the house for you. Now, I want to know if anybody has any questions to ask me. Yes, sir. Why did the churches, um, well, the building churches close to each other? Well, well what they did was, they, they didn't originally. They didn't originally. Matter of fact, Warren, Warren, when it separated, when it separated, it was up on Homing Hill. That was about a half a mile to the east of where the present town is. And in 1717, Hayward came from West Brookfield. He had a mill over there. As a matter of fact, there's a nice little sign for down Route 9, heading towards Ware. And it's in West Brookfield. It comes to a little pond there. The original dam is there, and the stone that all held the, the uh, bearing for the, uh, for the tub wheel. Uh, they, they, they were very good mechanics. And the mill would fail, and they'd get money from the state to, to, to fix it, and then it would fail again. So they come down uh, what's now called Old West Brookfield Road in Warren. They found this wonderful purchase down near the river. And they built a dam. And they started with this. Then other businesses came. So when the people that lived up on the hill saw that, they, uh, they said that, you know, this, this is a good idea. You know, this is going to attract people to run our road through there. So they moved downtown uh, in 1790. They moved downtown and they built a church on the common. And that's where it sat until it moved across the road. What they did was the churches sort of uh, 
nested in the areas where the populations were growing. And commons developed uh, significantly by the 1800s, 1820s. So the craftsmen began to circle the commons where people that didn't depend on farming so much for a living. And this is where a lot of people went to do good business. Well, what better place to put a church than where you're going to attract the people? So, and usually it was a center part of, of the community anyway. So this is why people did that. Any other questions? Anybody from West Berkeley want to throw stones? Uh -huh. <laughs> Any other questions from anyone? Yes, sir. Houses in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, um, man of houses. Mm -hmm. um, were those originally kits or were no, they no, 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 no. That was that was a French idea, and what it did was enable people to have hip room houses and other style houses. They might even have gable type houses to throw up a very simple room and create a whole new third floor. Right. And that would give them room for children or, or visitors or whatever else they wanted. And we had one in town, it was called the Lewis Mansion, and it was a beautiful, beautiful house in town and decided to tear it down one day because its maintenance was too high and there was no money spent on it in years, so <laughs> they just wanted to tear it down. Yes? I understand that that particular type of group was brought about because of taxation. And uh, after they got above the second floor, anything above would have been taxed again. But as long as they did it that, it was considered the roof. You know, I never heard of that one. In 1798, we were in danger of a war with France. Talleyrand had insulted our uh, representative to France. And we nearly went to war over that because he wanted money. He put his hand down and he said, we'll, we'll have a treaty with you if, well, they decided that uh, they would they would pay all, as much money as we had to for defense, but we wouldn't spend one cent uh, being blackmailed. So the government said we would survey every house in the New World, That's every state, survey every house, and they would list the number of rooms, uh, the number of windows, the number of floors. Uh, all of this was taxable. The style of house, who owned the house, where it was located. Those records are over at Old Surbridge Village right now. That's the census of 1798. If you had a third floor, you paid taxes on those buildings. On those so that sort of confuses that idea. It was a good thought, but it didn't, uh, it didn't pan out. Any other questions? Well, we spent nearly an hour here. I thank you very much for your patience and your time. Yes. Maybe just before you wrap up, uh, I'd like to mention the program coming up next month that you're giving in North Berkeley. Yes, uh, this gentleman from North Berkeley, he's uh, president of the Historical Society. He has some flyers he would like to pass on. But I, uh, I spent nine years studying Madame Jumel. It's exciting in its own right because it's a story of a woman who started her life as a prostitute, supposedly lived in Brookfield, so part of North Brookfield, supposedly lived in Rutland. Now, because people in towns are going to hate me when this is over, but anyway, suffice to say, she went on to uh, become probably the richest woman in the world. And when she died, it took 20 years to probate her will. All the Frenchmen that were related to her husband came over, they all wanted a piece of the pie. Her value was in, the, in, the, in today's dollars was approximately $33 billion. She owned a thousand pieces of property and houses in New York City, particularly in Manhattan. And, and uh, if you come to his meeting, you'll find out how she gained this wealth. She also married Aaron Burr. And I won't tell you how she got rid of that guy, but it's, it's a great story. And George Washington plays a part in this. Some people suggest he was more than a father to his country, so I'll tell you that story. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be in North Brookfield. At uh, Christ Memorial Church, the uh, Stone Church on Main Street. The Stone it's Church on Main Street. What day is it? The 20th? Uh, the 25th. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll try to be there. <laughs> He's got a flyer to pass out to you. That's a great program. I don't know if I brought enough so uh, families can share one. So, uh. Mr. Robin, what happened to the Methodist Church? The Methodist Church? They tore it down. Yes, they tore it down. The Congregational Church in, in West Brookfield, it's interesting to know that and. A man in town, Mr. Campbell, has a picture, but I couldn't get him in time for this. When the steeple fell off, and it actually went into the lawn, and it was upside down, sticking into the lawn, just as if it were narrow. And I couldn't bring that to share that with you, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I uh, just couldn't get uh, 
get in touch with you on time, please. Yes. Okay, so I won't forget that. Okay, folks, if you have no more questions, I thank you. Oh.